Hi there, and welcome to PhD at Living. Today continues our discussion on the Manhattan Project, and we pick up where we left off. We know a uranium atom can be struck by a neutron and break into two through a process called nuclear fission. We also know that neutrons are a product of nuclear fission. Therefore, if a neutron starts a fission reaction and is created as a product, it could theoretically propagate a nuclear chain reaction and release unprecedented amounts of energy. The question now is, can we actually make one for reals? The key here is moderating neutrons to thermal speed so they'll only react with the U-235 in order to induce fission that wouldn't otherwise happen if it weren't for the odd number of neutrons providing the added nuclear binding energy to split apart the atom. What in the absolute f did you just say? Ooh, key. I went a little quick there, didn't I? That's my bad. If you understood all that, you can jump ahead. If not, let's talk about Enrico Fermi. Born in Rome, Fermi was something of a scientific anomaly in that he was both an exceptional theoretician and experimentalist. For reference purposes, if I hear any of the words theory, simulation, or modeling, I break out in hives. In 1934, four years before Hahn and Strassmann's famous fission experiment, Fermi was bombarding atoms with neutrons in order to induce radioactivity. At this time, we knew atoms did funny things when you smacked them with particles, but we didn't know just yet that you could blow them right in half. Fermi, ever the methodical experimentalist, is smacking every known element with neutrons and discovers something weird. If he runs the exact same experiment on a table made of marble and then on wood, he gets different results. I would have almost certainly chalked this up to experimental error. Imagine being the guy that gets a bad result and goes, nah bro, it was my bench top's fault. Because science can be an extremely fickle mistress sometimes, an older lab mate in grad school told me to write down everything I could while I was running a reaction. Time, temperature, stir plate speed, weather that day, how I was feeling, phase of Venus, did the pens win last night, etc. I don't ever remember him telling me to write down what material the bench top was made of though. Good on Fermi for recognizing that was the cause. At any rate, the result of the experiment was weird enough that either there was something going on here with the marble and wood, or they were all just really bad physicists. On a day when his students were giving exams, Fermi decided to test the second theory. He wanted to run an experiment where he would put a block of lead between the neutron source and the sample. However, at the last moment, he switched out the lead and put in paraffin. Basically wax, lots of carbon and hydrogen. The sample in question started radioactively decaying like crazy. Fermi showed this to the physics department and got shouts of black magic. To quote the man himself, quote, there are two possible outcomes. If the result confirms the hypothesis, you've made a measurement. If the result is contrary to the hypothesis, then you've made a discovery, end quote. Fermi's discovery here is twofold. First, instead of capturing a neutron or being induced to radioactivity after being hit by one, some elements could slow a neutron down by scattering it, sort of like a pinball. Secondly, some elements react with those slowed down, dubbed thermal neutrons, in a completely different way than they react with the normal, faster neutrons. As it turns out, the closer a material's atomic weight is to that of a neutron, basically the lower the atomic weight the better, the better that element does at slowing down a neutron. This is why in Fermi's experiments he saw such different results when he was using the low atomic weight, carbon and hydrogen in the paraffin block and in the wood, compared to when he was using the relatively high atomic weight, lead block, and magnesium and calcium in the marble. The discovery of slow neutron chemistry earned Fermi the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1936. But it didn't explain the whole story. It didn't explain uranium. Uranium was special. After Hahn's discovery of fission with uranium in 1938, people discovered uranium would fission with fast neutrons and it would fission with thermal neutrons. Other elements didn't fission with neutrons of both speeds, however. In 1939, it was Niels Bohr again who came to the rescue. First though, a quick recap and something extra. Remember from our last video that there's a strong force in the nucleus that keeps the protons and neutrons together as they counteract the electromagnetic repulsion, specifically between those like-charged protons. At a low number of nucleons, protons and neutrons, the strong force is plenty to keep the atom stable. However, as you add more protons and neutrons, the electromagnetic repulsion between all those really closely packed protons becomes more significant. Eventually, the strong force isn't enough, and if you keep adding protons and neutrons, the atom becomes unstable. 
Interestingly, there are certain combinations of protons and neutrons that lead to an exceptionally stable state. These are called magic numbers and help explain why an element like helium-4 is so darn stable. On the flip side, they also explain why some elements are so darn unstable. Technetium and promethium are great examples of this because they're relatively low atomic weight elements but are still very unstable. Inside all this magic number talk is the nuclear binding energy. Nuclear binding energy is the energy it takes to rip apart an atom. This is the semi-empirical formula for nuclear binding energy. The formula is pretty intuitive, but it does have... Hmm? No? Oh, great. My producer is telling me that you don't care about this, so let's just move on. For our purposes, nuclear binding energy, and therefore atomic stability, increases as we add more protons and neutrons, think more strong force, up to nickel 62. Above nickel 62, the elements get less stable, not unstable, just less so, out to uranium, the highest naturally occurring element. Above uranium, there's just not enough strong force to keep all those protons together, so all the transuranic elements are unstable. Unstable in this sense is synonymous with radioactive. Now let's go back to Fermi's experiment. If you smack a stable element with a neutron, you can throw its nuclear binding energy all out of whack. Now being unstable, that nucleus wants to regain stability by releasing energy in one of a few predictable ways. You can release a helium nucleus, that is, two protons and two neutrons, in alpha decay. You can change a neutron into a proton in beta minus decay. Or you can even just release a packet of energy in gamma decay. Up to 1938, these were the only forms of radioactivity we knew about. In 1938, however, Hahn's discovery of nuclear fission showed us another way to radioactively decay. And one, in fact, that was so crazy that the atom was unstable to the point where the only way to regain that stability was to blow itself up. Fermi's seminal experiment in 1934 demonstrated that the speed of a neutron can make the same atom do different things. Which brings us back to the curious case of Fermi and Bohr and uranium. The crux of the issue is that scientists found thorium and uranium will fission under fast neutrons. But, and including Otto Hahn's first fission experiment, uranium will also fission under slow neutrons, while other elements will not. So what's going on here? Right around this time frame, the two main isotopes of uranium were discovered. By far the most abundant isotope is uranium-238, 92 protons and 146 neutrons. However, at a concentration of about 0.7% is uranium-235, again 92 protons but only 143 neutrons, an odd number. Back to our magic numbers discussion, it turns out that an odd number of neutrons carries less energy because one of the neutrons ends up being unpaired. Think Pauli exclusion principle with electrons except with neutrons. When you pair the neutron by adding another one and making an even number, you get a nuclear binding energy bonus gain. If you add a neutron to either U-238 or U-235, you'll get a slight increase in the strong force by adding another nucleon. However, in U-235 and only U-235, you'll also get a nuclear binding energy gain by going from an odd number of neutrons, 143, to an even number, 144. This gain in both strong force and nuclear binding energy is enough to overcome the fission energy. Niels Bohr qualitatively worked all this out in a flash of brilliance in 1939. Let's say that in order to fission you need 8 mega electron volts of energy, just a unit of energy. If we add a neutron to either U-238 or U-235, the increased strong force will be 6 mega electron volts. However, if you add a neutron to U-235, because you change from an odd number to an even number of neutrons, getting that extra nuclear binding energy gain, you get 2. Therefore, with U-235 and only U-235, the contribution of the strong force from the neutron plus the gain in nuclear binding energy by resolving the odd number of neutrons gives you enough to overcome the fission energy. With something like uranium-238 or thorium, which is almost exclusively the thorium-232 isotope, 
you only get the strong force contribution. You don't get this odd number neutron resolving nuclear binding energy, so it doesn't fission unless we change the energy of the neutron. If you think about the kinetic energy equation, one half mv squared, we can't change the mass of a neutron because it can't change the mass of much of anything, but we can change the velocity. Therefore, if we increase the speed of a neutron, we increase the energy. And if we increase it enough, let's say above two mega electron volts, then something like U-238 or thorium-232 will fission. Everybody always assumed if a fast neutron was good, a faster neutron would be better. As it turns out, with U-235 and only U-235, a neutron of basically any speed has plenty of energy to overcome that fission. The reason everybody was confused is because U-235 and U-238A were always intimately mixed with each other, being isotopes of the same element and all. It took Bohr's mind to elucidate all this and pull out the real answer. One final point. While I said uranium-238 can fission with a fast neutron, it has to be really, really fast. Like, almost impractically fast. In any other situation, the U-238 won't fission. It'll just grab that neutron, soak it up, capture it, and perform beta minus decay, transferring a neutron into a proton and becoming neptunium-239. So if we basically can't make U-238 fission, and U-238 is like 99.3% of regular uranium, how do we get a chain reaction? Beautiful question, and the answer is we make the neutrons invisible to U-238. While I said you can speed it up and have the U-238 fission, but in almost all other circumstances it will capture the neutron, there's a speed that you can slow it down to enough where the U-238 basically doesn't even see the neutron. Therefore, in order to get a chain reaction in natural uranium, 99.3% this stuff and 0.7% of the good stuff, you have to slow the neutrons down so this is the only isotope that reacts with the neutrons. Armed with this knowledge, Fermi set about to make the first nuclear chain reaction. His options were either make really, really fast neutrons to try to get U-238 to fission, or slow the neutrons down to the point where U-238 never saw it, and then U-235 would fission. Because U-238 fast neutron fission is highly inefficient and impractical, Fermi chose the latter. He would slow the neutrons down and have them only react with the U-235. In reality, the best chance was to get rid of the U-238 and react 100% pure piece of U-235, but <laughs> good luck with that. We'll talk all about it in episode 3. Fermi teamed up with Leo Szilard, he of the FDR letter in 1939, to design that reactor. Fermi knew the carbon and paraffin did a great job at slowing down those neutrons, so he suggested graphite as an option. Sidebar. A material that slows down neutrons is called a neutron moderator, or just moderator for short. The molecular slash atomic mass, the absorption cross-section, and the scattering cross-section are all really important parameters for a neutron moderator. Basically, the lower the molecular or atomic mass, the higher the scattering cross-section, and the lower the absorption cross-section means you'll get the most slowing down of the neutrons in the fewest number of collisions, and also you won't suck up the neutron entirely. With a lot more math than I'd care to discuss right here, Szilard came up with the reactor configuration. Basically, there's an optimal speed for a neutron to travel that causes the most fission in U-235 and the most invisibility, so to speak, in U-238. With that speed number, Szilard could calculate the thickness of graphite he would need to slow the neutron down to that optimal speed. At that point, all he needed to do was put the uranium blocks that far away from each other with graphite in the middle, and voila! You got your reactor. A cool video I saw said it was like a graphite cake with uranium raisins in it. How quaint! The original reactor was not particularly elegant, so Fermi dubbed the heap of uranium and graphite a pile. Like most things in science, the name has stuck 80 years later. Awesome. Done and done. With a workable design based on solid nuclear theory, all we needed now was like a million pounds of graphite and high purity uranium in order to get a critical mass of U-235. Let's tackle graphite first. Early in the game, Fermi and Szilard recognized that the regular graphite had too much boron impurity in it, and the boron sucked up neutrons like a hungry, hungry hippo. Incidentally, the German Atomic Project incorrectly identified graphite as being a poor neutron moderator because they didn't identify the boron impurity. 
At any rate, getting super pure graphite required extremely pure reagents and extremely high reaction temperatures, like 2850 plus degrees C. Less than half a ppm part per million of boron impurity was acceptable, and luckily, a branch of Union Carbide came through with it. Production began, and pretty soon the guys were getting a really good graphite. Which brings us to uranium. In an ideal world, 100% pure chunks of U-235 would be laying around in order to give us a little critical mass for that chain reaction. Unfortunately, number one, natural uranium is only 0.7% of the good stuff, and number two, uranium ore doesn't even come out of the ground at 100% uranium, much less 100% of one preferable isotope. Bummer, I know. Regardless of how it comes out of the earth, most uranium ore is generally pulverized and then mixed with acids, bases, and peroxides to separate the good uranium from all the other schmutz. What's left is called yellow cake and is composed almost exclusively of uranium oxides. One particular uranium oxide, uranium-4 oxide, is reacted with carbon tetrachloride ugh, to make uranium-4 tetrachloride. Now things get fun. When Arthur Compton's metallurgical lab was created, he realized that all those physicists would probably need a chemist or two to help out. Therefore, Frank Spedding from Iowa State was recommended to head the chemistry division. An expert in rare earth metal, Spedding was a natural choice to perform a lot of the fundamental work on uranium and plutonium. Over the next three years, Spedding and his group absolutely crushed the uranium purification process that became known as the Ames process. Thermite reactions generally take a cationic metal and an elemental metal and basically make them switch oxidation places. In the Ames process, we took a compound like uranium-4 tetrachloride and reacted it with zero valent magnesium or calcium. After the reaction, you have your elemental uranium, which is what we wanted in the first place, and you have your leftover magnesium chloride and stuff. Before scaling the process to production for Oak Ridge and Hanford, Spedding and Ames provided one-third of the high-purity uranium for Fermi and Szilard's reactor. Delivery drivers often had a hard time picking up the relatively small boxes because the uranium billets were so darn dense. At the end of the war, Iowa State was a recipient of the Army-Navy E Award in Excellence in Production. Of 4,300 recipients, including companies across the country, Iowa State was the only academic institution that received an E award during World War II. All right, now we have super pure graphite, heaps of good uranium, and the best configuration one could design. But would it work? By summer 1941, Fermi had six tons of uranium ore and 30 tons of graphite stashed at Columbia University in Upper Manhattan. After the United States entered World War II after Pearl Harbor, Fermi reluctantly moved to the University of Chicago at the now centralized metallurgical lab. Because people were justifiably concerned what would happen when the first nuclear chain reaction went critical, the project was moved 20 miles outside of downtown Chicago near the Argonne Forest. There was a labor dispute, however, and nothing was built, so to keep on track, Fermi convinced MetLab head Arthur Compton to put the reactor under the football stands at the University of Chicago. The first self-sustained nuclear chain reactor, named Chicago Pile 1, would take place on an old squash court. In an amazing, remarkable, and also awesome twist of fate, underneath another football stadium in Boston, Louis Pfizer was testing napalm for the first time. God, I love science! In order to build the reactor in downtown Chicago, Fermi convinced Compton that even if the reaction ran away, it could still be effectively stopped and not, you know, blow up the city. Initially, the reaction was going to take place under vacuum, so a 25-foot cube rubber balloon was custom-built by Goodyear. In a recurring theme with the Manhattan Project, it had such high priority in the military structure that basically it got whatever it wanted, no questions asked. 45,000 graphite blocks and 19,000 uranium and uranium oxide blocks were stacked by hand by high school dropouts, because of course a piece of critical war technology needs skilled labor. One group was in charge of stacking the layers, layer by layer, and one group was in charge of the control rods. Much like the uranium's job in the pile was to fission like crazy and propagate the chain reaction, and the moderator's job was to slow the neutrons down, the control rod's job was to soak up neutrons and prevent the whole thing from running away. In other words, the control rods were the things that prevented Fermi from blowing up most of Chicago. In Chicago Pile 1, the control rods were made of the element cadmium, a potent neutron absorber. Norman Hilbury tells this crazy story of Fermi in his underwear pushing a block of graphite through a shaper machine. 
There was so much graphite dust in this area at all times that Fermi, again, nearly naked, was completely black head to toe with graphite dust. At the 15th layer of graphite and uranium, a block of boron trifluoride was added. This was the neutron counter, a feedback mechanism on how well or poorly the propagating fission was happening. Originally, the reactor was going to be a sphere. However, the graphite and uranium kept getting purer and purer. Thanks, Frank Spedding! And Fermi calculated the reactor would go critical well before it reached a full sphere. After the 57th layer of graphite and uranium, Fer Listen, it's the best I can do, okay? After the 57th layer, Fermi calculated it would go critical. So the only thing left to do was turn it on. On December 2nd, 1942, CP1 went live. The reaction started slowly and two people were at the ready independently just in case something went wrong. One had a bucket of cadmium nitride he could dump over the reactor, cadmium being a great neutron absorber, and the other held an axe that would cut a line to a gravity-fed control rod that would slam into the reactor and kill everything if it needed to. Fermi ordered physicist George Wheel to remove the final control rod in the reactor, and measurements were taken every time Wheel pulled out six inches. Oh, grow up. This process continued for an hour. At 11.25, an automatic control rod accidentally slammed back into the reactor and stopped everything. Fermi called for lunch. Think about this for a minute. How much of an OG, tough-as-nails, ice-in-your-vein scientist do you need to be that, like, five minutes before starting the first nuclear chain reaction ever, the experiment takes an unexpected turn, and instead of charging through and finishing it out, you're like, all right, everybody, let's go get some Chick-fil-A. After breaking at 11.25, the experiment was restarted at 1400. Executive lunch much? After an hour and a half, the experiment was back at the last step, and the final control rod was removed. Fermi punched up a couple calculations on his trusty slide rule, nerd, smiled, and declared the reactor had gone critical. For the first time on December 2nd, 1942, man had created a self-sustained nuclear chain reaction. At just under 460 tons of uranium, uranium oxide, and graphite, Chicago Pile 1 generated enough wattage to power a small light bulb. It was a far cry from leveling a city, but that reactor was the Manhattan Project's first big win. Compared to some of the other successes of Manhattan, Chicago Pile 1 looks kind of underwhelming. However, and I'm being quite honest here, CP1 was the linchpin of the entire Manhattan Project. Sure, all the numbers said we could do it, but if we couldn't experimentally prove that uranium could self-sustain a nuclear chain reaction, there really wasn't any point in trying it in a bomb. Chicago Pile 1 was also the direct ancestor to the nuclear piles in Oak Ridge and Hanford that created the plutonium for the Trinity and Fat Man bombs. Now the challenge, and boy was it a challenge, was getting enough uranium and plutonium for the bombs. But that's for then, and this is for now. See you next time. The whole point was to find a way to practice nuclear war without destroying ourselves to get the computers to learn from mistakes we couldn't afford to make. Except, I never could get Joshua to learn the most important lesson.